Okay, I hope everyone can see us and hear us okay. Um, and it's our pleasure to be with you today, whether that's live here in the session or if you're watching at another time, um, it's great to, to be sharing with you today. Um, so um, I'll just introduce you to the team that will be from Diabetes WA that will be speaking today. So myself, I'm Deb Schofield, GM of Health Services. We've also got Gil Denny, Teleservices Manager, Alison Menzies and Jenny Nicholas, who are both CVEs um, and work on our Diabetes Telehealth Service. So what we wanted to do today was just start off with a broad brush of what and who Diabetes WA is and what the breadth of services we offer. And then we're going to focus in particularly on the teleservices component, uh, which is of great relevance to Country WA, of course. Um, and, and then just finish it off with some um, contact information, should you wish to know anything more at any stage. <clears throat> so as you can see, Diabetes WA has quite a broad range of programs and services that we offer. We've, we've been a not-for-profit health service organisation since 1965. So we've been around for a long time and uh, have, a, have a, as I mentioned, that real strong service focus with what we do, um, whether that's peer support, whether that's um, prevention programs, uh, whether that's specific programs for vulnerable communities, um, our telehealth service, health professional upskilling, the diabetes helpline that's been going for a number of decades now, um, lots of resources and information, and then um, our structured self-management programs and services as well. Um, <clears throat> and we, everything that we do is, is evaluated. We're really interested to know the impact that we're having. And so um, our evaluation is a, is a core component of everything we do, as is that promotion and marketing out to directly to consumers, because we want people to find out about what, the, what sort of support we can offer them. And we certainly want um, you as health professionals to know the support that we can offer your patients as well, both in, in that community realm and also in, the, in that clinical space as well. <clears throat> um, just to give you an idea of um, how much contact we have out into the community, um, we, you know, we have uh, our e-newsletters and website and um, we have thousands of people that come through our programs every year. Um, we have a lot of helpline calls as well that we deal with. And really at the heart of it all is, um, is actually getting people connected back into the right care and connected back into their local health professional services as well. So um, with that ability to have that reach and that contact into the community, um, that gives us that unique opportunity and that, that unique positioning in WA to be able to do that. Um, but this just gives you a, like a, a very broad brush of everything and by all means visit our website or, or you know, contact us whenever you want to find out more. <clears throat> The Desmond program many of you will be familiar with is um, diabetes education, self-management for ongoing and newly diagnosed. That's a, a flagship self-managed, comprehensive type two self-management program. And we know that from the consensus statements that came out from the EASD and the American Diabetes Association in 2018, um, we know that, that um, the recommendation is for a minimum of 10 hours of diabetes self-management education and support for people who are diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. Um, and the Desmond program is a one-day intervention that gives people a six hour, six hours of that 10 hour dose. Um, because these programs are delivered through the National Diabetes Services Scheme, they, they don't have to go through the NBS system because they are already funded through the National Diabetes Services Scheme. And we've, for the last uh, three or four years, have really had a, a big capacity building push out into Country WA, where we have trained local health professionals to deliver this program. And some of you will be familiar with that. Some of you might even be involved in that. 
um, but it's they are programs that people can self-refer into or their doctor or um, or other health professional can actually refer refer people in. There's no wrong door to get into a program, aside from making sure that people are registered on the on the NDSS. So that's a real uh, encouragement for GPs to make sure your patients are registered on the NDSS, because then we can absolutely get reach out and contact people and encourage them to come into these group programs. Obviously, at the moment. There are no face-to-face -face group programs um, because the, the timing of this, um, uh, this presentation is, is early May um, 2020. So, um, but what we, what we have been working on on behalf of the Commonwealth Government is an online version of this program. And that's called My Desmond. And uh, we're very thankful that the Commonwealth have said yes, roll that out, roll the program out earlier because of the current situation. And this is another way that people can receive that self-management education. It is currently available to um, consumers across WA, South Australia and Northern Territory. But next, next year, it will be available nationally and through the National Diabetes Service Scheme again. So it gives people choice. And it really helps to reach out to people who might be living in uh, places where those face-to-face -face programs are not running. So it's just to give you a, a flavour of what's happening at the moment. Um, we normally would run about 150 Desmond programs a year in WA, um, and we will continue to do that, but we will also now have this online version to support people as well. <clears throat> And don't forget about our helpline, which is currently running from 8.30 to 8 p.m. Monday to Friday. Um, and that can be for health professionals or consumers that just have a question, a query, or just need some support and a little bit of help, and we'll point them in the, re in the right direction. In fact, most of the, the um, places that we refer people on to is back to their GP for further review and support. Um, so just to give you that brush of um, uh, services that we have available, and I'll pass you on to Gil Denny now, our tele-services manager, as she just uh, gives you some introduction into our diabetes telehealth for country WA service. Thank you. Gil, thanks. Pass. <clears throat> Hi everyone, as Deb said, I manage the teleservices at Diabetes WA and I'm here today to talk about the Diabetes Telehealth Service. So we've been operating since March 2015 and we're available across all seven regions of Western Australia. We've seen more than 2,000 patients since we started and essentially we provide diabetes consults via video conference. Um, most importantly, we're a gap filling service. So we'll provide a service where there's no existing service in regional locations, or we might support a service that might be overwhelmed with long waiting lists, or perhaps we'll service an area that has a funded position for a DE, but they're not able to fill it. We also step in when diabetes educators take extended leave or even just annual leave. Uh, the services that you can see on our slide that make up the Diabetes Telehealth Service are diabetes education, the Telehealth and Chronology Service, the Diabetes Helpline, a specialised service for women with gestational diabetes and health professional upskilling for regional clinicians. We're also currently offering appointments in the Perth metropolitan area due to the COVID restrictions. So for those people who aren't able to access an appointment locally, they're able to access our service. So a little bit of detail for you about each of those services. The gestational diabetes service is provided by our CDEs who have extensive experience in this area. So a GDM referral will be triaged and the patient contacted by phone on the day that we receive that referral. And then we'll book them in for a one-on-one -on -one consult within five to seven days. Then we follow those women, they're closely monitored every week or fortnight during their pregnancy and then we'll also follow them up after their pregnancy. 
Um, we find it's a really necessary option for GDM women in regional WA um, who might not be able to access specialised health professional support. Um, also the timeliness of the referrals and the, and the appointments are essential for GDM and we're able to meet those needs instantly. Our team work really closely with King Edward Memorial Hospital and particularly with the nurse practitioner Marina Mickelson at the hospital. And we're also currently supporting Midland St John of God Hospital. Um, due to COVID restrictions, they're not able to see their women face to face or run group education sessions. So we're running group education sessions via telehealth and we're also inviting our regional women to those. And we also monitor the women weekly and fortnightly. Um, if their blood glucose are out of range, then we'll refer them back to Midland for support from the endocrinology and diabetes education team for initiation of insulin. The diabetes endocrinology service, um, that was developed with a lot of consult consultation with regional medical practitioners and specialists, and it was um, noticed that there was a gap in endocrinology support in regional WA. So we operate that clinic one day a month from our Subiaco office and our endocrinologist is Meg Hensie. Uh, we put a lot of time into the administration and the cl clinical support um, prior to the patient's appointment. So we make sure that they're very well prepared uh, before they see Meg to make sure that that appointment is as productive as possible. Our DEs will see the patient pre and post their endocrinology appointment uh, if the patient isn't able to see a DE locally. And we also sit in during the appointment. We really encourage clinical attendance at the appointments. And so far, I think maybe 50% of our appointments have been attended by the regional health professional, whether it's a chronic disease nurse or a practice nurse or a GP with the patient. Uh, we have an average wait time of about 38 days, which really sits with that fact that we only run monthly clinics and we have a 95% attendance rate. So we do work really hard on making sure that those patients are prepared and they turn up. We also spend a lot of time co coordinating with the GP and the local healthcare team of that patient before and after the appointment. Through our health professional upskilling program, uh, we deliver a one hour webinar every fortnight to health professionals in regional Western Australia. And we cover all topics related to diabetes, either our internal staff will de deliver those or we invite external guest presenters. And you can find information on those on our website and you can also book in for those on our website. We also currently have some services in development. So the home, the MBS items are available now for home medicine reviews to be provided by telehealth. And this will most likely be reviewed and possibly discontinued in September. So Alison, who will be presenting later, is an accredited pharmacist and we hope to pilot a home medicine review via telehealth program. Uh, then we can evaluate the effectiveness of that and provide some feedback to our funders and also to AACP and hopefully get that to continue um, or perhaps continue Medicare rebates on that. We're also currently in discussion with Perth Children's Hospital and we're looking at trying to develop a model for diabetes telehealth to support PCH patients transitioning to adult care into regional Western Australia. So to refer into the service, it's really straightforward. There's essentially no wrong door approach. A patient can self-refer. You can refer your patient in using a referral form that you can find on our website. You can contact us by email. Those contacts are also available on our website. Or you or your patient can contact our helpline on our 1300 number to speak to a customer services operator or to a diabetes educator to talk about a telehealth appointment. Um, once we receive that referral, we'll also follow up with your practice to make sure that we've got the latest pathology and medical history and any other relevant information. So how it works, we've got credentialed diabetes educators who conduct the telehealth appointments from the Diabetes WA office in Subiaco 
and the patients can link in from a local wax facility, from their GP surgery, from a community resource centre or from their home. Uh, they use Scopia through the wax facility and from their home we try and encourage video call but we can also accept Skype or FaceTime, really anything that makes it the most accessible for that patient. The, um, all referrals are triaged by a CDE on the day they're received and we accept referrals for anyone living in regional Western Australia with type 1 diabetes, type 2 diabetes or gestational diabetes as long as they're over the age of 16 and no longer in the care of PCH. So the CD's role is to support the patient to better position themselves to self-manage their diabetes and take responsibility for their own health. And our CDUs work very closely with the patient's GP and local health care team to ensure coordinated care. We also integrate very closely with our helpline and we allow, that allows easy access for the service for consumers and health professionals. We've also found it's really beneficial for Aboriginal medical services where appointments need to be opportunistic. So if we receive a call from an AMS in the helpline, we're often able to transfer that directly to a telehealth consult. We have a fairly multidisciplinary clinical team, so all credentialed diabetes educators with dietitians, an accredited pharmacist, registered nurses, a nurse practitioner and exercise physiologists. And we understand that telehealth is not always the preferred option, but there are instances where telehealth appointment can be the best option. So we found the timeliness of responding to referrals, particularly with urgent referrals or GDMs, we found that telehealth is invaluable for that. There's obviously minimal or no travel time for the patient. We have a centralised service, so we have our administration, our technology, our staff, knowledge and resources all in one area. If we do lose a staff member, we're able to keep all that knowledge. Uh, we're very flexible and responsive. We have the ability to provide crucial support when and where it's needed. We know that positions change and shift a lot in regional Western Australia and because we're so connected with regional health services, we also know when that's happening and we're able to offer our support when it's needed. Uh, the patient also has the opportunity to access the service from their home, which means they can also invite family or support people to attend the appointment with them. And it also means that we can link in with other healthcare professionals if needed in a consult and most importantly, it brings equity to those in regional and remote WA. So on remote WA, we've tried over the four, nearly five years of our service to connect with remote Aboriginal communities. It's something that's quite important to us and we've had mixed success, although we do are able to run a couple of clinics or support a couple of clinics that run in the Wheatbelt region. Um, but to increase our reach and access to these remote Aboriginal communities, we entered the Google Impact Challenge in 2015 and we were the successful recipients of a Google Impact Grant for our project, which is bringing care closer to country. Essentially, we hope that this project will allow Aboriginal communities increased access to an uptake of timely and essentially diabetes care via telehealth and that that care is relevant, culturally sensitive and delivered to the patient in their community. We've been a year now where we've been linking in with remote communities in East Kimberley with Rebecca Morgan Dunk, who is our coordinator of this project and she's based in Broome and we've had overwhelmingly positive feedback and certainly all those communities are very keen to engage with us via telehealth. So that is a very quick summary of uh, what we offer through our service. And I'll now hand you over to Jen, mm -hmm. who will deliver a, or talk about a case study yes. of a patient with type two diabetes. Thank you. Thanks, Gil. Just going back. So this uh, first case study is a man 
um, living in regional WA and he was diagnosed with type 2 diabetes more than 15 years ago. And I've listed there some um, past history of um, osteoarthritis, obesity and sleep apnea. And over the past few years, he's actually had um, glycemic control really to target with a mean HbA1c of around 6.7%. He does have some moderate non-proliferative uh, diabetic retinopathy that's being treated um, and his um, renal function is fine and his lipids are in, uh, within normal limits. And his medications include the following. He has a, a basal bolus insulin regimen and he uses a, um, um, a meter which calculates his uh, bolus insulin dose. He has quite a high dose of Lantus, um, or, um, 110 units, so that's what he was having uh, initially for the past couple of years. And um, the Nova Rapid um, would um, um, be estimated by the um, bolus calculator. Uh, also Giardiance 10 milligrams and Metformin uh, 2 milligrams, um, 2 grams rather, that should say, um, and Lipitor 40 milligrams and some antihypertensive medication and uh, medication um, for pain relief. And he was switched from the Lantus to, to JO um, approximately um, two months prior to the time that he um, self-referred to our Diabetes WA telehealth service. So he was concerned about a rise in his fasting blood glucose levels, which had sort of been to target um, before the switch to, to JO. So we saw him um, via telehealth and he was able to um, dial into our service from home uh, using video conference. And after that first um, consultation, we started communic uh, communicating with his uh, GP. So we were able to offer a multidisciplinary uh, team review by telehealth for this man. And what we did was we went back to some um, basic diabetes self-management principles. So um, uh, the CDE nurse was able to revise his insulin injection technique, uh, look at um, the onset and um, timing of his insulin, talk, um, talk through that with him, the action of the insulin, um, look at his insulin pen use, how is he um, storing the insulin, um, and just to revise um, that generally. And he was um, uh, using the pen correctly um, and he was having the insulin uh, in the evening before going to bed. We're also able to look at a glucose profile and also revive hypoglycemia management. Um, we also had a discussion about his activity and he did have some limitations um, in his activity level. He wasn't able to um, really to exercise. Um, he did have um, obesity um, and some limitations in terms of the amount of activity that he could engage in. He also then had a telehealth appointment with our dietitian CDE and she was able to do a full dietary assessment and make some suggestions based on that. Uh, we did um, pick up that he had been for some years now having a, um, a snack late in the evening. And this is something that had continued on from um, years back when he had initially been prescribed protophane um, insulin. So um, back then that was the um, suggestion that was made that he have something to eat later in the evening to avoid overnight hypoglycemia. So we were able to reassure him that it was probably unlikely that he needed to have something to eat later in the evening, um, given he was now having um, um, a basal insulin that was really unlikely to cause um, hypoglycemia overnight, having more of a flat um, action. We then um, had a joint dietitian and um, RN review, and we were able to look at these settings in his bolus calculator. Um, and just look at how his insulin was distributed across the day um, and also have a look at his insulin sensitivity um, or correction factor um, because that's how his Nova Rapid insulin was being determined. And this man was also eligible for the Libre flash glucose monitoring 
um, system under our patient experience program. So with another telehealth consultation, we're able to provide him with the Libre flash glucose monitoring starter kit and get him set up um, with the system and um, show him how to use it and to also share that um, glycemic data remotely um, to our virtual data management clinic. So um, we're able to um, have a couple more consultations with him and have a look at his glycemic patterns uh, over the day and night time um, to really get a snapshot of what his glucose levels were doing over about 24 hours. So this was good for him because it meant less uh, finger stick low glucose checks um, and also just to fill in some of the gaps in terms of his glycemic pattern. And what we wanted to do was to be able to rule out overnight hypoglycemia. Um, so that's something that he was a bit concerned about. And that's something that could potentially be contributing um, to his higher fasting glucose. And um, with the use of that system also, we were able to further reassure him that having a late, um, late night snack was probably not required given the insulin that he was now having. So we then um, obtain, um, also obtained a permission from his GP to assist him with his insulin dose adjustments under a shared care approach with the GP. The B to JO dose was uh, gradually increased and we kept up communications with his GP and um, provided summary letters. We also made a recommendation that he be referred to an endocrinologist to review the to JO dose and his other medications as well because he was on quite a high dose of insulin. He was subsequently referred to our WWA Endocrinology Telehealth Clinic and he was um, given an appointment in the next monthly clinic uh, where we also have an accredited pharmacist within that clinic with Dr Meg Henze and there was a plan made for follow-up by telehealth again uh, with the CDE. So the outcome of our interventions to this date, uh, we were able to rule out overnight hypoglycemia um, and he was able to make some dietary modifications. Uh, we'd looked closely at his insulin injection technique and that did mean a change to the way he was giving the insulin by splitting the dose. Uh, the Jadiance dose was increased and he continues to receive some guidance with the insulin titration and now we, we have an upper limit um, recommended based on the endocrinology consult that, that he had. So as educators, we have something to work to there. Um, and we continue to provide his GP with updates. Oh, Case of musical chairs today. <laughs> so, <laughs> thanks, Jen. Um, my name is Alison, and I'm the pharmacist, diabetes educator. I'm going to go through one of the uh, gestational ladies as a case study for you today. Um, she showcases our, our um, typical approach to how we uh, follow up each of the ladies and. Um, highlights it quite, quite well. She's a, a current patient still, so this is still something somebody that we're being reviewed at the moment. She's based in Narogen and she was referred on um, 25th of February um, by the local dietitian. Um, uh, OGTT came back with a high two-hour fasting. Um, increase in weight over the past year um, and first baby with IVF. She actually, she's done her consults through BC at the hospital and she works there at the hospital. So she's been seeing the, the local dietitian at the hospital as well. Um, and they've been having chats in and around as well as our service as well, which has been quite nice. And then we've followed that up as well. Okay. So we received the referral in on the 25th of February um, and on that date we actually made contact with Mrs MG and she was booked in for initial education on the 27th. 
the local dietitian sat in on that appointment as well. Um, and that was with our nurse diabetes educator. And in that education session, we go through the pathophysiology of gestational. We talk about exercise, we talk about carbohydrates, we identify the carbohydrates. We talk about portion size, low GI. Um, we talk about risk factors for type two diabetes in later life. So risk factors for mother and risk factors for baby as well. And then we ensure that they've been set up with a blood glucose meter uh, registered with NDSS so that they can access the test strips. Um, and then we talk them through the blood glucose level targets and, and explain what process we're going to go through from here. So um, at that initial education, at the initial contact, we would set them up with the NDSS registration form and the blood glucose meter organize, start that whole organization. Um, we also send them a three-day blood glucose form to fill in so that when we do review them, we can see what kind of foods they're eating and what levels they're getting and what modifications need to be made in and around there. Um, and then after the three-day food profile, we ask them to monitor four times a day, so fasting and two hours after each of the main meals and then do that every other day and send that through to us. We actually review them each week uh, following that initial education as well. So we've reviewed Mrs. MG. Um, we asked them to send through their blood glucose levels via email so we can have a look and then we'll either email them back or phone them back, whichever they would prefer. Um, and from the 27th of February, we have been doing that up until the 10th of March when uh, 10th of March we noticed that there was um, four out of the seven of the fasting blood glucose levels had been outside of range. So that's when we, we touched base with King Edward and see what they would like us to do and what, what their um, plan going forward would like to be. She had had a recent UTI, so that was handed over to King Edward as well. Um, and the email back from King Edward showed that asked uh, for us, so that the 10th of March was a Monday or Monday or Tuesday, early in the week. They asked us to, to keep monitoring and review, ask her to do it daily and review on Friday, which is what we did. So Friday the 13th, we reviewed again, noticed that the fasting levels had come down um, and King Edwards were, were happy, so we continued with our weekly review following that. In that time from the 10th of March to the 29th of April, um, it's not just the diabetes educator, um, not just one of our team that oversees our ladies, we ensure that we also, they do see a dietitian. So Mrs. MG has been reviewed um, locally by a dietitian as well, but we, um, her fastings continue to be elevated every now and again, uh, two, twice a week on average. So um, she was seen by our dietitian diabetes educator. And over the 10th of March to the 29th of April, we have suggested changes in supper. So she's gone from no supper to one server supper. That supper then was changed to a different carbohydrates, so she went from yoghurt, milk, then on to toast, crackers, cheese, um, one serve, then on to two serves over that time. And then on the 29th of April, when we reviewed her again, we noticed her fasting levels, there was four out of the seven raised. And that's one of our clinical indicators to show um, engage back with King Edwards. So we reviewed her again, sent her back to King Edward for review um, they suggested no supper so we went having had the one supper change of supper two supper two serves back to no no supper review again on the monday um, the levels actually increased having no supper so supper was reintroduced and king edward sent us the over this time as well we've had the covid restrictions and the COVID changes. So the fasting blood glucose level parameters uh, King Edward have amended to 5.3 with clinical um, 
input as to a case by case um, basis. So, although her levels were above the 5.1, they weren't consistently above the 5.3. So, when we reviewed again the 29th of April, um, King Edward's and uh, bore in mind that she was she's quite close to her um, due date. If we were to start insulin, bring her back to first, they they suggested because some of her levels were were still around 4.6 every now and again, 4.6 to 5.5. She's been. Um, they suggested reintroduce the supper and review. So this is the lady that we're still continually reviewing, and King Edward are happy to leave her with um, having had the occasional high fastings. Uh, her growth scan that has been done recently was, came back um, in the normal range um, and they were, they were happy with that. Um, so we continue to review her weekly. Um, but I just thought that uh, Mrs MG showcased quite well our team. So um, she's been seen and, and how we approach our ladies as well. So it's a team approach with um, input from the local dietitian and we've been back and forth with our local dietitian as well. Um, she's been reviewed by a pharmacist CDE, so me, <laughs> and um, nurse CDE, King Edwards and our dietitian that works here as well. We um, received the referral and she was contacted within 24 hours. She received education group uh, education through VC within 72 hours and to date she's had 18 occasions of service. Oh, and yeah, six occasions where we've um, formally um, communicated as, as part of a team. Uh, and this is a typical um, how we do approach our ladies with gestational. So it's quite a relationship, quite a rapport that we build up with these ladies because it's it's regular contact. Um, it's very re rewarding as part of the <laughs> as part of the role. So yes, um, and something very happy to help the regional ladies. So that's my okay. Um, to Thanks, um, Alison, that's great. Um, just to wrap things up, um, as you can see, there's um, there's a lot of support for um, that, that's, that's potentially there for um, patients in Country WA. Um, and we, we've started off the, with the, the broad sweep of, we, we've got a lot of community base, we've got a lot of um, informational things that we can provide. Then, we, then we've got a lot of self-management programs where people learn how to manage for themselves in their, in, you know, according to what fits with their world. And then we've got that um, wraparound clinical support that is there for those that need it. And um, you know, gestational diabetes is one of those um, sort of areas that that we've seen a, a big increase in, and I'm sure that that um, that would be your experience as well um, out in the region. So. Um, it's really important to provide that care, but to you know any type of diabetes, you know people can refer in, and we will um, give them, you know, review them and make sure that they're connected in locally as well. Communicate well with the GPs and the, and other local um, allied health as well. So, if you want to contact us, um, if you want further information. If you want to access a lot of downloadable resources on our website or, or find out how um, yourselves as health professionals can book into upskilling events um, or for your, um, for your patients, how they can book into different programs and services, it's all on the website. Um, and we really encourage people not to feel like they're, particularly at this time, not feel like they're isolated or disconnected from everything they can call our 1300 number and we will do a lot to make sure that they're connected in wherever they need to be. I think it's really important. Um, people can feel like, well, oh, there's no one near me. I can't 
you know, what, what can I do? I can't go and get the support I need. But, you know, we we are well connected across the state. We know who's who's out there and we know who we can refer to. Um, we hope we can resume our full suite of um, support services um, soon. Whilst we haven't been able to do face-to-face, -face, we have been doing a lot of webinars for both consumers and also um, for health professionals. So people can take full advantage of those. At least they, they'll be able to um, receive upskilling and information and support from um, our credential diabetes educators here at Diabetes WA. Really happy to help in any way we can. Um, please contact us and um, hopefully we'll, we'll get to, to catch up and meet some of you along the way as well. Any questions, just send them through to us um, and we're happy to answer those. Thank you very much. Thank you um, to everybody over there in the Diabetes WA team. I can't see any questions that have come through at the moment. So thank you too for putting your contact details up on your last slide. Um, so anyone who wants to get in touch with you, they've got the contact details there. Um, thank you to everyone who's joined us on the webinar today um, and for those who might be listening into it at a later stage, we hope that you have enjoyed the session. I'd like to say a big thank you to the Diabetes WA team for their time and for being part of the Rural Health Research Conference. And um, at this point in time, I think I will now close the webinar. Thank you, everybody. Okay. Thank Bye -bye. you. Thank you. Thanks very much.